So uh, I wanted to just say that was one of the points I made when I was making this talk, was the notion that we have our hand out, you know, with a begging bowl to help us protect this global, glo global biodiversity. The other uh, 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 defining thing, I think, for South Africa and in many African countries, and not so much in the north, is the huge differential between the rich and the poor in our countries. And this in itself is quite destructive and destructive for biodiversity. And we must take note in it when we're looking at some of the realities of developing an institution, which is why we constantly have to make the case how does biodiversity help us overcome this damaging differential uh, and why it's so important uh, to, to make the case for biodiversity and to show the case for biodiversity, particularly for those who are at the other end of, the, of that HDI divide, in other words, the poorest people. That kind of difference between the very rich and the poor is a destructive uh, uh, index, it's very destructive. I talked about South Africa and the history of land alienation, so the majority of people are unengaged and disengaged in science. Um, our education system for the last 50 years did not encourage black people to do science. Majority of our people are not involved in science. We're still suffering from the legacy of that. Um, so, unlike Ghana, our people are not dependent directly on biodiversity, or it's not, it's not as prevalent as it would be in a country like Ghana. Um, the, in South Africa, the issues around nature and conservation uh, is considered to be a privileged person's concern. When you're very rich, you open up a trust for, the, for nature. You don't open up for orphan children, but you open up a trust for nature. The very rich go to Kruger. Um, so it's considered to be a, a privileged person's concern. So you need, that's what, some of the things you have to overcome in terms of, of, uh, of making the case. And then of course, the African continent is rapidly urbanizing. South Africa, rapid urbanization, um, which means that the relevance of biodiversity has to take that into account. Uh, we're a changing continent, rapid movement, rapid urbanization, social ills around urbanization rather than than the other way around. The other thing that, uh, that all of us face from the African continent is we have to compete with fiscal funds because that's where majority of us will get our money. We might get a little bit of money from outside, but the way for sustainable institutions is to make the case to your government, get a slice of the taxpayer's money. That's that's part of a sustainable institution on our continent. Um, and we compete for housing, for health, for education, for infrastructure, etc. in that, if, uh, in that uh, 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 fiscal fund, our, our government budget slice. Um, and the language we speak is not heard by those who run the budget. So when we put the issue of ecological infrastructure in the debate we had with, with our, our people who give money, suddenly there's some kind of bell rung in the head of budget's head. Because we use the language that they understand. So we will probably get funding now for researching ecological infrastructure, which we would never have got if we had asked for money to do ecological work. So that, that was another thing that we, it would be useful to you to look at about the language. And of course, the link between a, a biodiversity and human well-being has been quite disjuncted for many for a long time and even last night I added this after we had the conversation last night 
while there might be a lot of criticism on the Convention on Biological Diversity, I actually feel, having been out of the sector for a little while, coming back to see our biodiversity changed, the notion of biodiversity changed, that I actually think we've made huge strides in biodiversity since the Convention on Biological Diversity came out. It's become broader and bigger. It's become a bureaucracy of note with lots of meetings. But the underbelly of it has been to raise biodiversity and to change the concept from being about biology, about zoology, about species, about ecosystems, but to add another element to it is about the human role, human impact and human well-being. So I think that's, uh, I see there was a paper uh, on, 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 on the CBD. Good, we always debate, always a good idea to debate these things. But I just want to also raise some of the successes. Uh, right, I think the other points I've made. So we talked, I talked a little bit about legislation and, and how important legislation is. I, I do think it is important, uh, legislation. Our National Environmental Management Biodiversity Act that created SAMBI actually says that SANBI must lead biodiversity information management and access to that information. It's very specific. And while a lot of our work would be to court and persuade and to make a good case, in the end, the fact that we've got that legislation gives us a bit of teeth. You don't want to push it too much. You want to have collegial relations with people, sharing because you want to share, but in the end, a little bit of a legislative uh, matter is a good one. We had a, a meeting here in February where the Brazilians were telling us that they even have legislation about biodiversity information, that all biodiversity information produced by any state money or any state funds must go through, a, through one system. We were very envious of that because we don't quite have that. There's no legislation that forces people to give their, us their information. Uh, but um, at least we can say we have legislated to lead the thing for South Africa. Um, we have a National Biodiversity Strategic Action Plan, which is quite unusual that it's got legal teeth. If you remember, the National Biodiversity Framework is a CBD obligation. And our strategic action plan, which is the broader version, has got legal teeth and we've got some uh, interesting, they might be worth you reading. Um, and all of these call for information management capacity. And then just recently, we are also in the climate uh, change white paper, climate change white, white paper, what is it called? Climate Change Response White Paper, which has just been passed through Parliament and also gives us a role in long-term adaptation work. So it also has a legal teeth in, in that place. And then because we're a state entity, we also have to comply with the promotion of Access to Information Act. Unfortunately, I think very driven by requests, individual requests from the public rather than the spirit of providing information to the public. But I'm sure it'll get there. Um, so we are established as a public entity. Uh, our legal mandate is, is threefold. The gardens, uh, knowledge and information, uh, uh, research, monitoring, reporting, status, a whole crowd of stuff there in the middle. And then um, the, the last part is to develop human capacity for the sector. So also very important part of the puzzle for a developing country is actually to have a plan around human capital development. Yeah. Um, you can't do it alone. You fall under a bus, the whole thing's gone. Um, you need to have a critical mass of people with skills. This is a time when you can't, 
You can't keep it all to yourself. You almost do have to work at human capital development because you just can't do it alone. So we are quite a unique institution in that we play in that whole value chain from knowledge generation, knowledge uh, agenda setting, as what you'd call it, from agenda setting to generation, to partnering others, to information, to providing science information and science knowledge in a form that policymakers can make decisions. And our board thinks we're crazy because our board thinks we're just it's just, we're just playing in too many areas and, and so all the time they're indicating that we need to narrow but when there's a, I think when there's an absence of other players, in particularly in many of your countries, you might find yourself having to play all those roles in the beginning. But it's, on the, as I said, the knowledge generation one, it depends on who your other knowledge generators are and how you play that. But it's, uh, I find, found in the last six years that I've been the CEO, every day there's a little bit of a tension and a battle between knowledge management, knowledge generation. It's, a, it's, a, it's an interesting thing around institutional uh, development. So this is a rather complicated diagram, but we want to show the value it's bad, it's like, it's like, this is like biodiversity scientists trying to be PR agents, okay. But we're trying to show that the work we do on inventory surveys, data on species, ecosystems, maps of bioregions, eco living plant collection of South Africa, as well as the work we do with the ADU, say for example on the atlas of birds, the butterfly atlas, a whole a range of things. How in monitoring and researching that, we then develop reporting systems on status, trends, impacts, management models, ecosystem species research analysis, taxonomy, herbarium collections. This was a way of showing to the world what we do. And out of that comes science-based policy in terms of the tools we give for people to make decisions. And in the end, it does have an impact on the economic and social uh, uh, situation of our people and therefore will create biodiversity richness. And on the side of that, we, we will always have to be dealing with human capital development in all these areas because the, the value won't come up unless you have that human capital development. And in all the areas is about information management and uh, information processes and how do we get information out. So I think Selwyn will talk a little bit more, but I just wanted to say, and I said a little bit in the background in, when I began about South Africa, and just to say that we have, one of the reasons why we're so biodiversity rich is we have major biomes in the country. Um, and so if you drive from Limpopo to Cape Town. You will pass through savanna grasslands, the felt, which is a big grasslands area. You will drive through the coastal belt um, uh, of the Indian Ocean and then fly the succulent Karoo, which is, I see, a hotspot globally. I see they've chosen two of those areas, uh, the succulent Karoo and the Fainbos, and we also have desert and various other biomes. This is why we have such uh, a wide uh, biodiversity, why we have such high biodiversity. Not a necessarily a big country. And that each of these biomes uh, have a unique rich, rich species uh, set. And that's why we are the third most biodiverse. So, and of course in the Fainbos area, uh, in the purple, it is a plant kingdom all of its own. Uh, no found nowhere else and it's almost it, 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 um, all, the, all the ecological niches of other, pl other kingdoms are all found in this one uh, group and it's quite fascinating. So they occupy uh, every role um, 
that other uh, plants occupy, and, but it's all in one group. So that's why we are so rich. And so in grappling with all these things, the concept of biodiversity, why you need informatics, why you need information, uh, why you need an institution like Sanby actually. We have tried in many ways, different ways, to depict it uh, that will make the public understand us. So this was one of the ways. This is a baobab and as you can see we're saying that we do plant and animal species work at the bottom there and then we do ecosystem work and we do applied research and ecosystem models etc. The previous uh, triangle was also a way of trying to explain what we do and I think why I wanted both of them in there was to say that it's sometimes a difficult concept to explain but you have to explain, you have to give some kind of visual explanation of why you exist and what you do. This one is not as compelling, I mean it's very pretty but it's not as compelling or as detailed or as true as the triangular one. So maybe we should develop the baobab with, with, uh, um, with some of those wording. But it was an attempt to say this is what we do because the biggest difficulty that we've had is to tell people what we do. Uh, particularly non-scientists. We talked about the managed network model. Uh, it's not cooperative, it's, it's, it's it not competitive, it's cooperative and it really harnesses scarce human resources and I use this every time I go to Parliament, this, the, the managed network. It is the most compelling thing for people responsible for money and resources. Not only your own governments but also funders. We had a funders round table the other day and I talked about this and they were, I said no, we, we refuse to compete. In South Africa we will set the agenda that we need for biodiversity. You will fund us against that agenda. You need to have that perspective. And we will not allow you to make us compete destructively with each other. So. You, we will not allow you to say we'll give money to the ADU but we won't give it to you. It's really important for you to set that agenda about your partners and have agreement about how to work because overseas funders can, be, can actually create quite a lot of tension between institutions and organizations. The other thing that you almost have to step on that wheel to begin is to be seen as a stable, fairly neutral, um, credible, in other words your information is credible, um, but with authority to convene this managed network. So we've got an agreement with our department that the message we, 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 we send. We provide the science with our partners. The science is not questionable. They do with it what they want. We put the science out into the pop, pop, into popular, we put the science out, people, people can all read this, it's on the website. The science is out there. What the government then does with it they will have to handle because what you must not do and you will not be considered to be credible is produce science that the politicians with the answers that the politicians want. It's a fine line because you are paid for by, by uh, state funds but if you lose credibility in that space, you, you will have great difficulty in coming back. So it's a face space you must fight, the issue about the science and what kind of science. So a large part of our role is to convene and facilitate and ca catalyze. The other successful factor, apart from having good academic institutions, is we've got a very vibrant NGO sector. Uh, and to tap in that, into that, 
uh, an NGO sector, if you've got it, not to see them as enemies, as the state and the enemy, 